Arman. This is the channel Agile Seeker. I'm Arman, and we're here talking with interesting people about interesting stuff. And today, my guest is Francesco Bianchi, uh, Agile, co Agile coach from Marsh and McLean companies from Dublin, Ireland. Hi, Francesco. How are you today? Hi, Arman. I'm doing very, very well. Thank you. There's a lovely sun here in Ireland, which is not that usual. So that makes me quite happy. <laughs> Okay, yeah, usually good good weather is always with a good mood. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I suggest to start how you're getting into Agile, what's your path starting? How would you start to your path in, in this industry? Um, let me tell you a story if you want of sure. how I started. Um, let me spoil the secret. I'm, I come from a software development background. I've been a software developer for roughly 10 years before I discovered my love for Agile. Uh, but my first encounter with Agile actually started quite a long time ago, it was around 15 years. And, and I just left my first gig, my first engagement that didn't end in the best way possible. Uh, and I ended up joining a team that I discovered later was absolutely fantastic, one of my best experiences in life. Uh, but the location where this team was working was not the ideal one, not very. Uh, so we were three, four very young people straight out of college, maybe one, two years of experience each. And we were uh, the first ones to join a team that then became a an, an research and development team with now maybe more than 50 people, 100 people, I don't know, very successful one. And so we were the first one in this space, quite boring, very dusty, an office that no one had used for, for quite a while. Uh, computers were not exactly up to standards mm -hmm. but it was part of the transformation and the, and the innovation that we were going to bring to discover and bring and there was this dusty book um, in a hidden area called um, crystal clear from alistair cockburn and it was there and that was my first introdu introduction to agile i had not learned anything really never even heard the word agile uh, at university uh, but then I found this book, a very small one. Uh, I flipped through the pages and then I read it. I read it again. I think I read it three or four times. Uh, very thin, fantastic. And I said, I want to do this. But it was also almost alone. Most of the projects I was working on was either by myself or uh, later on with a second person. And so I could never really put in practice most of the techniques that were described there. Uh, but the thoughts have always been there, information radiator, walking skeleton, exploratory 360, were words that were in my mind and somehow shaped my evolution as a software developer. And my dream at the time was to be an architect. So my progression to become a software architect. Um, and over the years, I forgot about Crystal Clear with just a few notions in mind. Um, and then, Nothing happened for 10 years. I kept on working mostly alone or in teams of two, three people, not too much agile awareness. So I studied Scrum because I felt it was what I wanted to do, but I could not experience it uh, until I made the decision to move to Ireland uh, because I was looking for you know, different type of setup and projects and context and companies, the big tech companies. Um, and I joined a company where I was able to work with a larger team, part of a product team, and I was interacting with other teams in, uh, in the same company, working on a project with people dislocated. And then I started discovering, well, I like less, much less um, uh, coding. And I love talking to people, looking after team dynamics and how people interact. And at a certain point, I spotted this name, Alistair Cockburn, popping in my inbox among the 2,000 other mailing lists. I said, oh, and the guy came in Dublin uh, to run a one-day workshop. And I said, okay, uh, that sounds like an interesting sign from the past. I want to go and explore more. And so I attended this workshop, and that absolutely blew my mind. So I already know, I was already transitioning in a Scrum Master role at the time, but meeting the guy was like the light bulb moment. I said, this is really what they want to do from now on. And so I started attending trainings and now <clears throat> I, I may call myself training addicted, training junkie, because I need to attend trainings all the time and learn and experience and I'm loving it. 
Yeah, so it's a sign of a faith, I can call it. Yeah, so you read a yes. book and then you meet the author. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic experience, actually. Um, so if there will be a movie about agile and development, this is definitely going to be a script for this. <laughs> I see. So um, as a software developer, like on the beginning, there's um, the, the, the whole legend about creation of Agile Manifesto, about all these Agile values was about that software, de software developers, they uh, decided to work somewhere or something else rather than traditional project management, rather than traditional values, and they decided to develop something new. So um, as you started as a software uh, developer with, in the non-agile uh, times yeah let's call it like this will there was this transition for you and the uh, people that are surrounding you in terms of the projects no not everyone accepted it was agile that time i do believe and not everyone accepts agile even now i mean there are different people with different uh, approaches so how was your um let's call it buy-in for your teams how are you gonna approach them like this is the correct way this is the good way we will deliver value for the customers for the team how was your um, approach for that? Um, so interestingly, I didn't find many resistance from what we could call business. Uh, my principal struggle was not having many peers to interact with uh, and bounce ideas with and share a desire for introducing proper engineering practices. Mm -hmm. um, so I never had to really convince um, and, and this comes from the fact that I mostly worked in startups, uh, in many startups uh, during early stages of my career. And so there you don't have the usual constraints where you, you need a strict roadmap, there's much exploration. The business themselves are very keen uh, to have a development team that can uh, move around and change priority and react very quickly and very flexibly. Uh, the challenge there was about technical excellence. You are in a fast-paced env fast environment, a lot of pressure. Uh, you don't have many resources in terms of money and licenses to buy the right tools. You don't have many expertise, much expertise around you. Not many people uh, that can invest some of their time in learning and building the right infrastructure, learning about new technologies. So you're a little bit on yourself, on your own. Uh, with maybe another couple of people, you're trying to figure out everything while you still have to run fast. So the challenge for me was mostly internal, if you want, a little bit unconventional. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so um, one of the truths that the uh, agile coaches are talking about is some that are constant learners. You mentioned so you're training and addicted. I'm, I open you a secret that I'm the same. So like whenever I see an interesting training, I start to dig it up in the description. Will it be valuable for me? And like uh, almost 99% of times I found that in some way it will be valuable for me. So I guess I attend it. But uh, this is very challenging actually, in my opinion, for a agile coach to keep this constant learning uh, motivation throughout the year. So you mentioned it's like about 15 years. So the technologies, the agile, and the overall people, they changed a lot during this year. So um, what's your, uh, let's call it a trick, how you keep yourself motivating, despite the fact that you are getting interested in everything that you're touching, like obviously I see that, but um, like there's always some place, yeah, in human soul that I'm like, ah, I don't want it to do it, I'm like, just don't, don't the perfect day, but then you end up of participating of training, learning something, all this evolution, how you keep yourself motivated? Um, well, I think there are at least two goals and two types of trainings that you attend. Uh, the ones that make you excited, and there I have a couple of ideas, a couple of tricks that I'm happy to share, and the ones that are useful for you. It's like uh, thinking of a piece of cake or your vegetables, and you need a balance of both in your life. Uh, so for what concerns the cake, something that gets you excited that you really want to do, uh, I found that variety and changing all the time uh, is important. Uh, because yes, you can get tired of cake, you can get tired of pizza, you can get tired of all the most, uh, the tastier thing in the world. You need to change. Uh, and so if you spend, I 
studying my own history, I discovered that I have a six month cycle and every six months I need to change focus somewhere else. So I'm trying organically without really thinking about it now. I'm just aware of it. And I'm seeing that my training focuses on different areas every six months. They're all usually all related, uh, different facets of the same job. But by just changing that, it's very hard that a topic becomes stale. Um, something that works for me a lot because you change topic, you're always a newbie. And the process at the beginning, it's fantastic. You're exploring, you're discovering, you grow incredibly fast. And that's very exciting for me. That's very stimulating. And that keeps me going. And when, you know, you start slowing down and it gets boring, it's time to move to the next thing and get a new injection of energy. Um, I'm finding now, but even that, you know, even the a repetition of injection of energy gets boring over time. So I'm finding that finding trainings where first I fulfill a need that I have, which is learning from the best people of the industry. I, I almost, I think I, I follow a fairly different approach from yours. I don't almost read the outline of a training. I choose the trainer. So I know who I want to learn from. And so for me, there is the dimension of being inspired by a different person every time. And that brings a lot of variety, a lot of fulfillment. And then I'm trying to pick something that can be useful, that I can use somewhere in my life. It doesn't have to be my career. Um, and that was almost a year ago now. I went for training with Bicablo in visualization and, and I started using that all over the place. My menu where I, me and my partner plan uh, meals for a week. It's now a flip chart and we put post-its and I decorate that. Uh, I'm starting preparing flip charts for uh, festivities at home, for parties, so to decorate the home. Um, so all of a sudden my skills are embedded in my life. I find tricks and ways to use them. And this somehow takes us the space of, okay, how not to get bored of a cake? But then you have your vegetables. And then I think variety is still key, but then also having a plan is important. And for me, the plan usually has been, I, I need to have an exam at the end of the course. So if I know that I have typically certification at the end, whether it's industry, it's interesting from uh, an industry perspective or not, I care up to a certain point. But if I have an exam that helps me being accountable to myself uh, to get that passed at the first pass that gets me enough motivation to help me start being with focus. I see. So very interesting point actually about the certification. There is a constant myth, um, let's call it like the Scrum and Agile and project management and so that about these certifications, about the worthiness about necessity of having all this certification. What's your approach? I mean, um, how do you think about uh, getting a certified in some certain action? Is it more, is it as valuable as it was 15 years ago? Um, I explain why I'm asking this question because many people I talk with, they saying like, you know, 15 years ago, being a certified Scrum Master or certified Agile coach was much more valuable because you were unique, because you were like some of the like, let's call it top elite club, something like this. Currently, it's much more feasible. And this is this is good, actually, I mean, in one case, because much more people are available for this. But on the second hand, um, does it possess still some such value as it was like, um, I, I think, 10, 15 years ago? What do you think? What's your approach to certifications? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think there are a few key certifications that still hold value on the market. And I'm looking at the most basic ones, actually, CSM and PSM in the Scrum industry. So professional Scrum Master from Scrum.org and certified Scrum Master from uh, the Scrum Alliance. And there is definitely something uh, in the world of SAFE where I'm not super familiar. But if I remove these three, and I'm not taking into account PMP, MPM, ISCP, so th that side of the world. I would say that all the rest from a market perspective, based on what I've seen, being both uh, a recruiter and, um, and a person being recruited, hold very little value, um, mm -hmm. if none at all, if any at all. Um, 
I'm finding that a lot of exams are fake and irritating to a certain extent uh, because there is the big word certified, but then you go and do the exam and it's trivial. And so you feel tricked. And uh, I don't feel so good um, when saying I've done this and I've done that because I know there's not much uh, depth in that specific exam. That said, uh, I found incredible value in learning um, during the trainings that are required for certain certifications. So there the goal is not the badge, which is the more the process. Yes. Uh, and I met some of the best scrum, well, not, well, scrum in my case, but in general, agile practitioners in the world. Uh, when you sit in a class for two days with my con, or you go through an experience in a workshop with Jeff Waltz and Paul Godard. That's something that then you bring back and that transformed my uh, career, literally. So there was incredibly well spent money, uh, great effort. And yeah, out of that, I also got a badge. Good. Well done. Um, as a, an, an interviewer, as when, when I am looking for agile profiles, as being on the other side, uh, not as an IRI manager, but someone helping with the hiring process. What, what I like to look at is not so much, I'm never impressed by the single certification. Uh, I have a good sense of what is valuable and tough to get and what's not, but I like to look at the progression. So what mm -hmm. areas are of interest for you? Somehow a way to tell me, I focus on these two, but not the third one. Okay, and how fast have you gone through those? Last year with the pandemic, we've seen a big explosion. Have you been a person who has learned only for one year in your life? Or have you been someone who has accrued certifications throughout 10, 15 years of your life? No, that I get a good sense then. Have you been made redundant in your six months available versus it's part of your lifestyle? Yeah, I think, I think yeah, this, this perfectly makes sense uh, because there was an um, absolutely explosion of certification with the last year because uh, also, uh, this brings a problem because they are all transferred to the online format, and there are many of them with the offline format. And there was like pretty much difficult to um, pass the certification, despite the fact that learning also the currently online format makes, in my opinion, it makes it easier. But still, I think uh, for the people who are just ju just jumping in, yeah, in the profession, like. Uh, initial certification brings value in terms of the companies that are hiring them. So in that case, the companies are sure that at least they are not uh, have to teach people for the basic stuff. So I mean, uh, whenever I'm doing the like hiring, when I'm like evaluating the candidate, when I see that he's like, for example, PSM certified, I know that I have to work with him to maybe elaborate some of his values. But at least I know that I'm not have to explain him what is the difference between the spread backlog and product backlog. No? And and this this is this is thing that that brings the most value. Um, what is interesting is actually your transition. So you like you, you tried everything and then you transition to agile coach. So being a coach for my me is the person who is not only teaching people how to do some stuff, but guiding more than guiding. So there is a for for me as an agile coach myself is there is a thin line between like teaching and coaching. Yeah, you know that, that that's 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 very tricky. So whenever you teach someone that everything that is written in the Scrum Guide, when there's manifesto, you should know by heart. And the second one, when you gradually see how people evolve, yeah, because you're coaching, you're guiding them. So how was your this transformation to the agile coaching when you feel you're in yourself this um, readiness, yeah, to guide people, to uh, motivate people? Because I do believe that all the perfect coaches are like great motivators. So how this this uh, started? Um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, and I think again, in the most normal way, maybe I didn't evolve naturally um, more, well, more than naturally, yes, in the more traditional way to be an agile coach. Uh, I was not part of an organization where there were already agile coaches and I grew from Scrum Master Typically, that's the path into the role, uh, thanks to the guidance of someone. I, I recognized that I was doing something different in my job, and there was no job spec that fitted what I was doing. And I said, okay, I don't fit in the role that the company has given to me. 
this is not what I'm doing. And so I looked on the market and I said, the closest thing that I can get to is being an agile coach. But I recognized that I'm not there. Uh, and so I started working in two directions. One was learn. And there I started training heavily. And the second was I need to teach to the others what being an agile coach is because it's a new role in my company. And I discovered that by teaching, I learned a lot about what there was. And so I refined my initial understanding was very off as it always as it very often is. And so I started refining and sharpening my understanding and my vision and my definition. Uh, and as I was discussing with people slowly, I gradually started bringing them on board with the idea, starting with managers who had somehow to support my idea and say, okay, I see value here. Uh, I authorize that you keep on focusing in these areas and uh, approaching people in this way, uh, being less impact impactful on the short term is actually like you said there's a big difference between a consultant and a mentor and a coach uh, you see change in a much uh, longer time frame um, and while doing so i also started talking to people who were interested about agile uh, but not very well versed yet and they started getting more attracted by uh, the idea and with them, I had a chance to practice what it meant to, because there was no formal project assigned for me to grow them into a role of Scrum Master, for example. We started conversing and gradually they started learning more. Um, and as I was learning about coaching, I started taking a different stance, where instead of teaching them what I was learning as I was going, I started asking them questions and seeing them grow. And so organically, we created that relationship of, coach and agile practitioner looking for someone um, that can adjust help them seeing if then if they're going in the right direction yeah i see so one interesting point that i noticed is that uh, currently in your linkedin profile i noticed that you are helping more than 200 teams in your current workplace so this pretty much this pretty big amount of people so um, there is also one misconception, I think, that uh, there is much more easier for an agile coach to work with the small teams rather than helping uh, a lot of teams. Uh, I personally don't agree with this because uh, this is just two different approaches. It's not about, I think, being harder or easier. Everyone, everything has its own obstacles. Uh, what's your opinion on that? And um, as I... Um, uh, why I'm asking this because you are a perfect example for this. You, you mentioned that you are started with a small amount of people, like two or three person in a team, and currently like a very big amount of people are um, under your guidance. Let's go on your coaching stuff. So, what's the difference? What the things that you can compare with the way you were conducting your job, conducting your coaching, and all this agile working back in like 15 years ago? What changes? What what drives what drives you? Um, many things, I would say. And the first one is that you need to see yourself as part of a team uh, in a different way. You're not the person with agile expertise and orientation that joins the teams that requires that. Uh, and so you are the most knowledgeable team member there. All of a sudden, your team becomes a team of coaches. Uh, the 200 number is a little bit optimistic, we're around 160, 170. Uh, but it was when I wrote the article, that was the information I had, uh, the, the, uh, the bit. So it was not intentional. Uh, but still, it's a fairly big number. We are talking in the range of 4,000 people. Um, you would never be possibly able to do that alone. So you need to do it with a group of coaches. And in my case, there's a mix of coaches that are internally uh, placed. Uh, as permanent roles within my organization, uh, within my center of excellence. And we have a group of people that we are bringing in from the outside. So altogether, we may be looking at 20, 25 people that are working together. And so in there, even the challenge of coordinating that work is a big one because it's much bigger than the usual team you would interact with. And that's something that you need to start thinking about. So how do I coach my team in a way that is compatible and possibly coherent with the way that other coaches coach their team? Secondly, I don't need to coach my team alone. I can get help and actually need to start factoring in the fact that I'm not the coach of that team, 
there are typically two of us assigned to cover the team. There's typically the main point of contact, but there's always someone in support. You are not there with the team all the time. Uh, you are not the assigned Scrum Master on a team that joins them on day one, maybe the first time that they start scrumming if that's their thing, or going through uh, a Kanban flow if that's the other thing. Um, but, and you stick with them and you see them grow and you bring them to a level, you help them until they get to a level of being very high performing uh, teams to the point that you can simply step out and there's no impact. You can't cover 200 teams all at once. So you focus on a few ones at a time for short periods of time. And you go in, uh, work with them a little bit, then stay back, step back, keep a light touch, a lighter touch during the engagement and even lighter after you have temporary check-ins, uh, which means that you can't, you can hardly uh, get to know people very well. You need to be able to trust your in instinct much better. There's not so much time to go and overanalyze things. You need to go in, you need to have developed a sense of almost a smell. You need almost to know that's what I need to, what I need to tackle. But if you're if you're an agile coach, you also need to be very careful and say, I is, know exactly where the problem is, but I need to pause here and let the team evolve into that. Uh, and you don't have much time for mistakes if you want. It's not like you will with a team where you are for two years and say, okay, if it doesn't happen in three months, it's okay. Um, and the, the additional challenge for you is that very often you plant a seed today, and that will not. Uh, grow into a plant until you've left the team. So you will not be there to see the results. And that's an additional emotional challenge. It also makes hard to say, to evaluate for yourself, have I been successful? Have I helped them? I don't know. Uh, I may never know. Um, occasionally someone may come back and thank me, but that's what I get. It's a very different relationship that you have. Yeah, actually, I perfectly agree with you. And uh, one of the points that you mentioned is about uh, stepping aside and see how the actual team is executing what you coach in them. And we uh, and you may not never know if it helps because that you leave the company or leave the plate before before it even started. This this is also a misconception, I believe, for the agile coaches is that. Um, I think for the project, it comes from the project management itself, like from traditional itself, the saying that project manager should have technical knowledge of the industry he's worked in, he's working in. Uh, and I perfectly don't agree with that because I do believe that it's, it's a bit different role about managing all people and they make them work together, like unite them. And I think that is something that is gradually evolved to a coach, yeah, from starting from agile project management, yeah. So uh, it's not about doing the work instead of the teams. It's about like showing them their mistakes and let them to fix them by themselves. And this is, I think, the most tricky part that uh, in coaching can be. Because most people have a misconception, even in companies in management, I do, and, I, and I, face this, I face this a lot uh, in our country, in Armenia, it's, it's faced a lot. But they, when they hire an agile coach or someone who is doing the role of agile coach, they expect him to solve the problem by himself. But um, the issue might not be uh, possible to be solved by the agile coach because, for example, it's a huge company, huge company. Yeah, for example, there are 50 people. I do remember there was one case um, then one of the CEO, one of the CEO, one of the companies asked me to, uh, you know, we try, we, we want to try agile. I heard a lot. It's a perfect methodology mindset. Let's fix it. I feel that in my company, there is a toxic mindset and people does, doesn't commit all this ownership. Uh, so I started to dig it up. I, I asked, I talked with people like for two days, asked them different questions. And you know what? They didn't receive their salary for the past six months. And uh, in that condition, people are expecting that the gel will fix this? Absolutely not. <laughs> so it's something much more deeper. And then there is a, like false uh, expectations about the agile calls. You cannot like um, build something on this false grounding. So this is, I think, the idea that many people in, in our country um, 
are saying that we tried Agile and it doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for our model. It doesn't work for our people. And I perfectly don't agree with this. Have you ever met this uh, misconception about, yeah, you know, um, Agile is good, but we tried it. It didn't work out for us. It doesn't work for our model of business. Our people are too, they need to be controlled. All this like self-organizing stuff is not for us. Have you heard this a lot? During your entire, during your career, obviously. I mostly not. I would say I never heard something so clearly spelled. But then you see how people act, and you understand that that's what they really think. Though. Um, so yes, definitely working teams saying, surprisingly, agile is not fast enough. We need our teams to be faster. And we need to control exactly what they do today and in the next two hours because I may need to change direction in every two hours. And so let's drop Agile. That's too strict for us. So it's almost on the other side of the scale. Um, that I heard. Um, actually, so yes, to your answer, yeah, to, to your question. Yes, I heard. <laughs> uh, somehow I was dismissing that. But, yeah. yeah, actually, the interesting part in, in here in this part of the world, but I, um, just 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 continuing the idea that you're saying that no no not everyone just saying this directly. The issue of Armenia, not not the issue. The uh, interesting part of Armenia, people are very direct, you know. So if they don't like it, um, I had an interview with uh, Nigel Baker a couple of weeks ago, and he was like, uh, there was a. Ter- Terrific example he made. He said, like, there are always different people. Some people try something to eat and they don't like it and say, mm, not bad, but I don't like it. And there's two second, uh, like, group of people who are saying, no, that's disgusting. I don't like it. I will never try it. And I think the agile coach is something in the middle. I mean, uh, this is the person who can balance these two people. Yeah. So um, I think it's all come from the correct, correct expectation from the companies, from their management and what they actually want to achieve. And this is creates an issue, you know, Francesco, I think um, with all modern coaches, let's call it like with all this plenty amount of people who are coaching in different stuff, not only agile, their life coaches, I don't know, fitness coaches, maybe I don't know, everyone is, everyone, everyone is coaching. In there. And the market is getting bigger and bigger, yeah? So um, what is keeping you um, not to lose focus about what is your style of delivering the value? I mean, I do believe that every agile coach has his own, let's call it trick, let's call it like this, and a unique approach, how he uh, candling the people, how he make people think, how he motivates, how he works. And so each coach has its own approach. So I'm not asking you to open your secrets, obviously. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but just to understand about this, um, throughout these years, obviously you have your own style. How not to lose it in all this modern noise of coaching, let me call it like this, without offensing anyone, obviously, but all this noise, what do you think? I I don't think I'm gonna say anything smart here. It may sound almost uh, an answer that is trying to dodge the actual question. Uh, I think you need to ask yourself constantly to do self-coaching to yourself and asking, go back, reflect, do your mini retrospective on paper or whatever that is and think, is that me? Look at yourself constantly and say, is that me? And maybe, and maybe sometimes you will not recognize a certain episode, yourself in a certain episode. You need to be very mindful because maybe you are evolving, you are changing, and you need also to be accepting of some changes that are happening in you and some that maybe you won't bring into your life. Uh, but constantly ask yourself, is that me? And am I happy with what I'm seeing? Am I true? And once you answer that question, Again, coaching question, am I truly happy with what I see? And so you do that with rigor constantly. It doesn't have to be every day. Uh, if you are into journaling, that could be fantastic. If you are into mindfulness, it could be a great exercise to add as part of your mindful routine, uh, if you like. 
but in general i think that's the question yeah, I, I think it's a very good approach. And one of the things that you're mentioning is this mini retrospectives that you said with yourself. Uh, and this drives me in the one good idea. Uh, there are plenty amount of people who ask me like, you know, Agile is like specifically for technology companies. It's like for IT. And I always um, disagree with them because for me, Agile is it's, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's the way you uh, behave. It's the way you, you live actually, yeah? So I'm, when I'm trying to explain it, it's much more easier to uh, in, your, in, in the example that you make. Yeah, so like in any iteration, like whatever you make uh, for yourself, like it's two weeks, one month, whatever, you just reiterate and ask yourself the same two questions, what I was doing right, what was wrong, what I can do better. And this is, I think, something that can be applied to any kind of industry, any kind of people. And, it's done, that's, and, and, that's, and this, I think, brings us to idea that Agile currently is uh, raising popularity because people are starting to understand its power, I think. So, because um, mostly in our country uh, where the project management itself is very young, I mean, like something around 10 years and Agile is even younger, something around, I don't know, maybe six or seven years, at least when I started to dig about it, it was very young. And that in, even now it is very young. Um, people tend to, to tie it up with IT. So if you are not in IT sector, if you are not in technology, then don't mess up with Agile. It doesn't work like this. This is a common misconception, I think, that you need to be covered in the, in the future. And I do believe that the future generation will fix it. So for, for me, Agile is just a mindset that is going outside of any kind of interest. And this like mini retrospective that you, may, that you mentioned, this is a perfect example how a person can find his inner rest, yeah, about thinking about his own processes. Yeah. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask, so I, I, I usually see in LinkedIn that you are going to a specific courses about this illustrating and everything. So this is perfectly aligns with the thing that you've mentioned a couple of minutes ago, that there are various trainings that all of them some adding some skills. So um, I do see a perfect example of Agile Seeker and behind you. Thanks for that. <laughs> and um, just for, uh, as an interest for myself also, um, it's a very unusual, um, I mean, uh, hobby, let's call it like this, illustrations for Agile coach. What uh, did you find in it? I mean, why your like choice for the next training go there? Because I see actually from your post, I see, even they see this energy, you like it. You, you really like it. And um, what kind of uh, lessons, let's call it like this, you get it from there? And what uh, can a person take from a, um, I do believe something that is perfectly not related with the agile coaching, but it serves to it. Um, I, I, I think a lot of things are coming together and solving a problem that I had, which was close to your previous question, what's my style and how do I keep my style? I'm a very visual person. I, I didn't know, but I love colors, certain types of colors. Uh, I love things that happen fast and that can be collaborative and that speak a lot and that can augment the reality uh, and that can, people can grasp without need to talk and that can convey also emotions and movement. And I found this in visualization. Um, I just started my journey. There are so many areas that I don't know nothing about. Um, so visual thinking is something I just started scratching the surface. I think I'm learning the skills to be able to draw, but then the visual facilitation bit is still fairly new to me. Um, but what I'm finding is a way to express myself and to talk to people at a level that pure words cannot. So by, uh, this is an example that I made here to somehow bring a mood. Um, but I discovered that during one of the trainings, I prepared a flip chart where I explained the structure uh, of my new team and what we are trying to do across the organization. And I used that to tell the story to all the candidates when they come. And I've done that now 50 times, I think. 52 maybe, uh, I should have played the counter. And I can see the difference with how I'm talking to people now, telling a story now, uh, with the support of visuals that 
help them create a mental map and then we can go back to that and use it as a really almost as a map like a like on a board game and move and move ourselves in the space and say now we talk about this theme or this initiative or this area versus in the past when you are just describing something and it's abstract and you don't understand what that is so i'm finding a, a way to enrich my language and to read that allows me to reach people at a much deeper and different level i see very good answer actually and i do see the value on this and um, interesting thing is that uh, it's very old known technique about that people tend to appreciate visuals much more than text or or, or even verbal connection yeah so uh, people like what they see, they, they like colors and evidence, and this obviously can be used in terms of coaching. So you already started to implement this on your, on your job, on your team, on your like, day-to-day -day basis, or you're just waiting for getting a little bit more mastered in this and then uh, use it in your job? Um, I actually have been incredibly brave, if I may so myself for once, uh, on this. I, I was so excited by what I was learning uh, that I started using things straight away. I, so the, 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 the group, the training providers that I chose uh, are Bicablo and they develop their own system. Uh, say, when I say that is mostly Martin Hausman who was the inventor of the Bicablo system and now there's a network of trainers, amazing people. I love the community there. That's what keeping me so connected to them. Um, but there are plenty of other fantastic trainers and systems out there. This is just the one I chose. So I, I chose them, came across almost, well, without the almost, by chance, uh, when was that? a year and a half ago, I think, uh, when I set up a, a meetup with a colleague. And since then, I was curious. April last year, I think, I was supposed to do my first training, but then something went wrong because, you know, COVID happened and so the trainer couldn't, uh, traveled to Dublin, we couldn't meet in person, but then we managed to do it remotely. And I think uh, we arranged for maybe May or June last year. Straight out of the training, two days of very intense, very cool training. I had a company-wide event around, was um, an internal conference around agile topics. And I started there for the first time, I started to do graphic recording on a flip chart of a panel that we had. Uh, and I simply pointed the camera to what I was doing and showed that. Or I ran, uh, during training, I started sketch noting things, uh, a live training where I was uh, studying how to improvise with other teams with Paul Godard, was doing the training and sketch noting, and I showed that. And it's incredibly simple to do. So I'm finding that I'm, to me, it comes natural to use it because of how the technique is structured. It allows people to adopt it even if they are very rough in the way they draw and you get better over time and since then i'm starting to introduce it in any place where i can so i mentioned um 50 interviews in the space of three months that's quite a bit of my working time this day yeah, it's quite a big yeah uh, but i'm using it to enrich murals for example if i'm running a workshop uh last year around what was that september october last year i ran a workshop for the exact level of one of the companies i work with and there were in one case 17 people in another case 40 people including exact exact level and their direct reports and we made the mural look pretty we made it personal in one case i draw the faces of all the 17 participants and we use them to decorate uh, the mural board and then the the package where we collected um, the documentary, if you want, of all the session. And that made it so personal for them that they still remember about the outcome of that meeting. So there are many different places where you can use it. I see. Yeah, actually, it's um, one, there is an old technique, let's call it like this, that people can help through the visuals uh, fight with their fears. And I, uh, I do think that many people will um be much more comfortable to draw something rather than tell something yeah when you are like talking with them and this is the way that uh, agile can help and the visuals can work all can work all together 
Um, but it does come a little bit, um, let's call it nester for the last two years, I do believe, because all this COVID stuff and everything goes to online. So uh, with all this online stuff, the idea of coaching uh, had to evolve. Like inevitably, uh, it can stay the same. So even the famous Tony Robbins, I think he doing all these events like online with all these multiple thousands of people. And this is completely different energetics as for me. It is much more difficult, I guess, to get the energy from person, at least like on the other side of the laptop. And this is um, for, um, in my opinion, I mean, for the agile coach, this is a moment of truth. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's about of testing the agile values of working respective of being offline or online. So what you're thinking on this, how the online uh, world, let's call it like this, changed your approaches? And what do you expect uh, to go for future? Because I do hear from different instances that online world or this pandemic changed everything and much part of the world will never go back to offline in many occasions. So in that case, Agile Coach should adapt and how do you think they will adapt and what, uh, what to expect in future? Yeah. So here with some arrogance, maybe, I would say that the Agile community has been blind for many years uh, yeah. because it's true I, I fully agree that the best way to work has been the most effective and fun way to work is to have the people that you need being co-located at a very close distance. It's not even enough to be in the same building. You want them to be mm, close enough that if you shout uh, without shouting too loud, if you call their name, they, they will listen and they can turn their head. So that's the ideal. Fantastic. That also has a lot of limitations because you can only have so much expertise in seven people in the same room and attracting more people, it's tough. Uh, but there's also been, I think, completely unrealistic and not the reality for, I have no statistics, but I would bet 90% of the teams across the world have had mm -hmm. at least one person who was not sitting with the rest of the team whether there was because they had a policy of people being able to work from home or whether because they had a team, uh, an offshoring team for typically, typical use cases testing, but could be for support, could be for other things. So we've all been working, and I'm focusing on IT here, but I'm sure it's the same pattern for other things. I have personally worked since the moment I, I left the initial startups and started joining slightly bigger organization. I think I worked, for eight, nine years now, I wouldn't know exactly, but let's say nine, nine years about in a row, in remote teams, distributed teams. And so there the component of being present was a false perception. Yes, I was enthusiastic to work with the people in the city where I was located, but there were many people that I was neglecting, not realizing the disservice I was doing to them. And so now we have been forced instead to shift our mind, the way we look at things. We are the ones uh, being remote. And also the thought leaders have had to face this. They have not been able to dodge it anymore. And I think things have happened. The things that has happened from a perspective shift should have happened eight, nine years ago. We were just too stubborn in avoiding that. So with that in mind, in terms of the future, uh, I have no idea. I don't think anyone has any idea on what's the percentage of time that we'll be allowed to spend in the office and how much it will be worth spending in the office. And that will vary for person from person to person. But I think that the nature of work in substance will not really change. We will work in the future in the way we should have worked in the past. It's just that before we didn't know and now we know or we should have learned, let's put it that way, because people will revert back to the old ways, despite the learning. Yeah, but inevitably one way or another, it's everything changed. So yes. we just uh, we just need to keep it up. Um, I know you, have, you, you mentioned in our discussions previously that you are uh, also you are conducting training for people and you are conducting speeches. So you have two more at the end of April, I do believe you mentioned. Um, uh, any details on this? So what, what, what's the general topic that attra attracts you? 
I mean, uh, do choose your topic so you see something more familiar, more aligned with your vision about ever about what do how do you see the agile world, and then you can say, hey, I have something to tell, I have something to share about this. How it usually works? How you choose topics? Um, I can give you the example here because I think it's quite uh, emblematic of my approach. Um, I'm presenting two, so the, the, the event, thank you for <laughs> for remembering that, by the way, the event is called Tech Fair Live. Uh, I think it's the 30th of April. It's an uh, all online event, it's free. Uh, so I submitted two talks. Um, one is about what to do uh, when you fail in a sprint. So let's define what failing a sprint means and what are different shades of that failure something is evident and something is not so evident is more subtle mm -hmm. let's explore those and let's see techniques to help us be more successful even in the failure because failing is good if you learn from it and you don't get hurt uh, during the process um, failure is a normal result of an experiment so in that case, I picked a topic that was dear to me for two reasons. One, it was brought up by someone in my team. I saw that as a recurring theme, and I felt there was a source of negativity in the team. And so I felt that by focusing on that, I was able to help a group. And I said, if it helps that person and that team, it will probably help someone else. Helping in what? Feeling better. Simply feeling better about themselves. So that, that's a big driver for me. Uh, and the second talk was suggested to me by a great uh, Agile coach. By the way, she works with Nigel Baker, and she's called uh, Ashlyn Green. Uh, and she saw my activity, and we were chatting, said, you know, Francesca, like, you're so passionate about visualization. You should talk about that. Uh, and, and so I prepared a topic on visualization and what, how you can use it in different ways. So I tried to do a live demo uh, of different ways of, employing, uh, using visualization in your storytelling, in your recording of events, and in your process mapping. Um, and so here, the theme is passion. So it's help people feeling better about themselves, finding ways to, so helping them indirectly for the talk or a big passion that I have. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so it's about something that is more binded to you. I mean, for your character, what is interesting for you to share the opinion. And it's perfect, I think, in a way that uh, whenever we conduct some talks or uh, having a discussion on a topic, it's always two-way connection. I mean, something you're telling to the audience and something you're getting from the audience. And this is, this is always working in a way that uh, it cannot be single time. So it's, it's uh, I, I hate monologues <laughs> in terms of when you're like, uh, you know, you all, you know this stuff. Yeah, yeah, someone is speaking about everything and that, blah, 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 blah. And just at the end of the talk, everyone is bored and everyone is like terrified and wants to sleep. So this, this is the, this is the, I think the agile power that can like uh, do the talks in a way with all the visualizations, obviously, that the person get interested. So any, any idea how can I participate in your event or it's a bit closed one? <laughs> it's not closed. Uh, as far as I know, tickets are still there available. Uh, techfairlive.com, you can subscribe, you receive your ticket. Recordings will be available after the event. So Very good. Very good. Yeah, I will obviously join. I had an opportunity last year to participate with the uh, a perfect summit, there was a Agile Online Summit, and I got interviewed by Joe Watts, uh, by the servant leadership. And it was very interesting talk, you know, um, about uh, servant leadership in non-mature countries. As I said, Armenia is a very young um, country after the independence in 1991, the Soviet Union, and there's all this natural hierarchical leadership of all throughout the years and everything. It's this fantastic opportunity to look through it. And, we, we had a very good talk with, uh, with Job. I will obviously try to find time and participate in your event. So that I always uh, tend to find some stuff on this. So um, as a general, let's call it king question at the end of the, all the interviews that I conduct is that um, considering ourselves like more older generation, let's call it like this, what will be your advice for the younger generation for people who are just 
jumping in, in agile, jumping into this world of projects with people management, like interacting with people. What will be your advice for them? Uh, maybe to learn, maybe to interact, maybe just to have fun. So what will uh, you as an agile coach will say to a person if he comes to you for advice? I would say don't discount anything. Try, try what feels right. Occasionally also try what doesn't feel right because there's learning also in that, always in a safe space, but try, learn, experiment. Don't discount something without trying it at least once first. Then you can say, that's not for me. There are so many things that will not work for you right now, but as you evolve, as you change, that may give you an idea later, or they may be become your thing that was not good at the moment for you in, in that moment of your life, but it will become very good later. So just go out and try. Yeah, perfect advice, I do believe, yeah. Uh, many people just now stick up on the books and everything, but the true value of learning, true value of becoming someone is experimenting. So thank you for that. Thank you for amazing talk, Francesco. This was an honor for me. Thank you for a fantastic visualization. I see, I do remember, and I do look very, very good on this picture, much better than I look in my <laughs> real life look. So get uh, proceed with this, proceed with visualization. I do, I do hope that we will have one more talk in future. Uh, so try, I will try to keep in contact and um, see what we can do all together, maybe do another session about the visualization solely, if you will find time in your tight schedule. But as for now, thank you very much for, for, for this interview. I think it was, inter it was very, very interesting. Thank you for that. So uh, this was the channel Agile Seeker. We were hosting Francesco Bianchi, Agile, co Agile coach from Dublin, Ireland. And we are here, we finalizing it now. Thank you very much. Goodbye.